to our Bible study for Sunday the 9th of August. I'm joining to you again from our, my office, um, but still glad to be joining with you. Obviously, this way is a, a one-way communication, but please, if you do have any uh, questions, if you've got any disagreements, if you've got any points you'd like clarified, if you've got more in-depth discussion that you'd like to have, um, please feel free to email uh, the address shown on the screen or visit gipschurch.com and we'd be more than happy to further the discussion around these classes or really anything else relating to um, the Bible in the church. Uh, so we are continuing with the study that we started last week on women of the Bible. Uh, it's important to emphasize if it's not already clear that this really isn't a study about teaching women how to lead good lives at all. Rather, it's about trying to teach all of us, and really trying to teach me. <laughs> Most of these classes I learn, I'm sure, far more than the audience who have to sit through my monotone drone and, and listen. Um, but yeah, these classes are really um, for, for all of us, uh, especially me. And to be honest, I'm staring back at myself on the screen, so really I am teaching myself in some ways. But... I do know others are joining in, and I'm grateful for that. Um, but all of us are trying to learn simply how to live godly lives, and through these classes, how to live godly lives um, based on the historical experiences and, and the scripture record that we have of these women. Uh, last week, if you haven't caught up with the class, it should be available on YouTube, on the Gip Street Church of Christ channel there. Um, so it was all about Eve, and uh, we really looked at Eve as the mother of all living and how um, we can sort of capture a lot from her, looking at the idea of um, creation and how in all of us we see um, through her the, the human dignity and uh, similarities that we share. Likewise, the dangers of temptation and um, the need to think critically and to not just take at face value information that's presented to us, that at times we can um, be um, the victims of manipulation. We can be part of people trying to um, present uh, false information in a very alluring, a very tempting, but nevertheless a malicious way. And we are responsible for the choices that we make with that information. And then if we make poor choices and go down ways that are self-indulgent, ways that are clearly against what God states, um, then we end up in a state of damnation and of losing those things most precious, first and foremost, and ultimately only, our soul. So this week I want to flick back to the New Testament I want to look at two women who um, I guess similar to Eve in a way in the Old Testament two women who are the mothers of promises fulfilled you might say two women who really begin um, this New Testament the new phase of God's engagement with humankind and really it's um, as I'm sure you're aware, in many ways, uh, fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy and a fulfillment of God's plan made all the way back to Eve, that though she be um, bruised on the heel, that Satan himself would be bruised on the head and bruised ultimately through the saving power of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, who was foretold by John the Baptist, who came into the world via uh, Elizabeth and Zechariah, and then through Mary, um, and obviously Joseph as her husband, but through um, Jesus Christ coming into the world. So I think these two women really do have um, a lot that we can learn from. So firstly to uh, Elizabeth and Really, uh, a lot of this text is taken from Luke chapter 1, and so um, obviously there are um, other gospel accounts that are, are helpful, but 
really focusing on Luke chapter 1 in this class today. So Elizabeth is described by Luke as a woman of integrity and of obedience in Luke chapter 1 and in verse 6. She was both the, the daughter and the wife of a priest, according to Luke 1 and 5. And clearly she lived uh, a righteous life, even though she carried a, a quiet sorrow because of her childlessness. And uh, this may well have you know, continued, and she, I'm sure, would have expected this to continue, but uh, a miracle occurred. Her husband, Zacharias, who served in the temple at Jerusalem, he was the, the first person in 400 years to receive a, a direct word from God, at least that we have recorded in Scripture. While he was burning incense, an angel appeared to announce that his wife, Elizabeth, would have a child, and that child would be named John, according to verse 13. And there's remarkable similarities if we think back to Abraham and Sarah. Again, both uh, a couple in their old age who had thought they were past uh, bearing children, heirs, and all that accompanies with that, the, the grief and the abandoned hope. And um, in that instance, Sarah, and we'll look at Sarah in the coming weeks, but she was um, struck dumb because of her, her disbelief, uh, I'm sure, entirely understandable disbelief. In this instance, it was Zacharias who, um, you know, I guess we would use the word flabbergasted, um, expressed doubt that, that this would happen, um, I would hesitant, um, suggest that it was um, entirely understandable doubt, but nevertheless, when it comes to God's word, uh, we can clearly see that um, you know, doubt is something that we should entertain um, very cautiously and learn to trust in God. And so just as Sarah um, was struck dumb for a period of time, likewise Zacharias was um, struck dumb to the point where he had to write down the child's name on a, a tablet for him to be named at birth. But back to Elizabeth. Um, so Elizabeth was the, the first to recognize Mary as Nazareth, Nazareth, as the mother of the Messiah. When Mary came to visit during Elizabeth's six, sixth month of pregnancy, um, we're told that John leaped inside Elizabeth's womb when Mary spoke. That's according to Luke 1 and, and verse 41. It's a really lovely sentiment, isn't it? Um, a lovely scene. Elizabeth understood immediately uh, the imminence of the Messiah's birth. What a, a wonderful blessing to have you know, late in life and to experience all of these things. What a joyful time the two expectant mothers must have had as the godly Elizabeth shared hospitality and wise advice with her young cousin. Her interaction with the young Mary clearly distinguishes Elizabeth as an outstanding mentor. It brings to mind the characteristics that are named in Titus chapter 2 and verses 3 and 5 in the ways in which um, older women can care for and provide direction for um, younger women coming up through generations. So Mary left after three months being with Elizabeth and you know, sharing, I imagine, the most unique of um, birth stories and you know, pregnancy accounts. But Elizabeth's joy continued with the birth of her own child in Luke 1, 14 and 24 and 25. Not only did Elizabeth miraculously conceive a child in her old age, but also God once again came more broadly to his people in fulfilment of centuries of eager anticipation. John the Baptist became a powerful preacher of the message of repentance and the forerunner who introduced the Messiah. Jesus said that no one was greater than this son of Elizabeth. 
Matthew chapter 11 and verse 11. Elizabeth really could have faced her old age with a sense of failure and of waning faith. But her vibrancy of spirit serves as a reminder that God watches over every woman with loving care. Elizabeth trusted and God rewarded her. She shared herself liberally with Mary and undoubtedly she trained her son in the Lord while she lived out her faith before him. And of course her story is so closely intertwined with that of Mary of Nazareth and we've already covered some of that. And of course Mary herself, um, we need to distinguish between Mary Magdalene and other Marys that we have recorded, but Mary of Nazareth, really there was no other human who was closer to Jesus Christ on earth than Mary, his mother. Each of the Gospels in the book of Acts includes her as a woman uniquely gifted to share her son's earthly life. Matthew introduced Mary of Nazareth as the betrothed wife of Joseph, who was a just man, according to Matthew 1 and verse 19. And the angel Gabriel appeared to her with the birth announcement in Luke 1, 26 to 8. Mary's response clearly reveals her keen understanding of Scripture and her, her ready willingness to obey God. The awesome concept of yielding her body to the Holy Spirit as his instrument was sure to be misunderstood. I mean, such a unique experience, how could it not be? But Mary's spirit of total trust and God's pleasure. Overwhelming as the news was, she submitted herself to this assignment, as all people of faith and sincerity and humility do. And she did this with joy. Luke 1 and verse 38, I think, is instructive. We read there that um, it says, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. These words of Mary, we do well all to emulate in whatever way in which we're called to serve God. Not focusing on how difficult or how confusing it might be for us or all of the ways in which we think it shouldn't apply to us, but rather simply, let it be to me according to your word. Of course, Mary isn't you know, um, completely removed from all of the, the cares of the world. Intertwined with this spiritual insight are the anxieties that every mother necessarily goes through. Joseph Joubert, he said, No man is really old until his mother stops worrying about him. I think it's right and proper that Certainly parents, but you know, perhaps mothers more so, um, are so deeply invested in, in caring, often the day-to-day the -day, um, concerns of, of their children, and those things one doesn't just set aside easily. I think it's right and proper that um, mothers and parents should have anxious moments for their children, and they are such in a position of responsibility and love them so much that of course these things manifest at times um, through through worry, through concern, through um, desire for the very best for them. When at age 12 Jesus failed to join the family as they returned from Jerusalem in Luke 2, 41 to 50, or when the wine at the wedding feast was insufficient, John chapter 2, or when she was concerned during his ministry in Mark chapter 6 and in verses 2 and 3, or when she stood there horrified at his crucifixion. Her son graciously responded to his mother's disquiet on each occasion. 
I'm always emotionally affected by that scene right near the end of Jesus' life where he tenderly places Mary in the care of John before he died. He says, Behold my mother, behold my son. I just think it, it demonstrates Mary's love for Jesus and how that must have been made so plain and so clear to Jesus. And he must have known how distressing the scenes that were playing out were for her. And so he made sure that she received um, the very best you know, emotional and all the support that she needed through his closest confidant, that of John. Mary and Joseph became the parents of other children. Um, Mary probably experienced early widowhood, but she shines as a, a faithful wife and mother. When Mary appeared publicly, standing at the cross and praying after the Lord's ascension in Acts chapter 1 and verses 12 to 14, she demonstrated her courage to the world. She was marked as one of his, liable for persecution, along with the other disciples of Christ. The unknown maiden from the despised Galilean town of Nazareth, she illuminates for all time one of the essential natures of womanhood, and indeed of, of humankind, that of entrusting to the next generation the message of God's faithfulness, whether through the rearing of one's own child or through the task of spiritually nurturing those that might extend beyond the family circle. Not only was Mary God's sovereign choice to bear the Christ child, but she was also a devoted and humble follower of the Messiah and of God. I think this is perhaps best seen in her song of praise, which we read in Luke chapter 1 and verses 46 to 55. And this really describes a, a perceptive heart that is overflowing in exultation, not focusing on herself. And isn't it ironic that through the centuries after Mary, so many people seem to want to venerate Mary and make her into something that she was never intended to be, thus perversely taking away from the focus of Christ himself, from the focus on God and what he was intending to do simply through Mary, which was bring Christ into the world as the saviour of all. And Mary herself, we see in these words, in her, her song, that she was focused on the Lord. And it was he that she was paying attention and gratitude to and simply humbly serving. And I think likewise, we would do well to learn from that. And so to conclude, let me read out um, Mary's words from Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55. Really wonderful poem of um, thanksgiving and praise to God. She says, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. As his mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, 
to Abraham and to his seed forever. Many thanks.